In the last lecture, we discussed De Broglie hypothesis, according to which each material particle has a wave associated with it and the wavelength of this particle is lambda equal to h by p, where h is Planck's constant with which now we are now familiar and p is the momentum of the particle. And if this particle is non-relativistic, that is its velocity is much less than that of the velocity of light, then lambda is equal to 1 by square root of 2 m e. That is the De Broglie hypothesis that each particle is associated with a wave. And this shows you an animation of a particle moving and the wave also moving along with it. You remember we said Davison and Germer experiment will verify De Broglie hypothesis. And now we uh, have this apparatus here. We have here an electron emitting filament or electron gun and we have an anode which accelerates these electrons and then we have a crystal here on which the electrons are incident and then there is a detector which can move on a circular arc. That is the arrangement that is a, a, a cathode and anode which accelerates these particles and then they are incident at the crystal at an angle phi and there is a detector here which can move on a circular arc. So that is the arrangement. Now, the whole apparatus is placed in vacuum so that the electrons do not interact with other particles. What would happen if electrons did not have waves, if electrons behaved like particles? Being very tiny, they would suffer diffused reflection from the irregularities on the crystal surface. See, if these electrons were behaving like particles, there would be diffuse reflection of these electrons from the irregularities on the crystal surface. Electron is being very tiny, it will find these irregularities and will get reflected. And since it is a diffused reflection which is in all directions, therefore, this detector would not detect any change in the intensity of the scattered beam. But if electrons behave like waves, then the situation would be different. How would it be different? A sharp peak was detected at an angle to the original direction. At an angle phi to the original direction, a very sharp peak in intensity was detected. The electrons were accelerated by various potentials. Here is the variable potential difference and it is changed so that electrons are accelerated to different potentials. And in this case, electrons were accelerated by various potentials. The sharpest peak was observed at 54 volts at an angle of 50 degrees as the accelerating voltage is varied around 50 volts. The, this voltage is varied around 50 volts and this angle phi, if this difference is 54 volts, then a peak, a very sharp peak is detected by the detector at an angle of 50 degrees from the incident beam. That is the observation. De Broglie relation shows that the wavelength of a particle is inversely proportional to its momentum. That is lambda is equal to h by p. In order to have wavelength of the size of the spacing between the Bragg planes of nickel, so that the effects of diffraction of electrons from these planes are maximized, the potential has to be around 50 V. You see, why should the potential be around 50 V? You must, you have seen in an example we solved earlier that if the potential difference is 50 volts, then the wavelength we expect from the electrons is of the order of 1.67 into 10 to the power minus 10 meters. That is why the potential here was varied from 50 to say let us say 75 volts because that potential difference gives the wavelength of electron which is of the order of the spacing of Bragg 
planes of this crystal. So, this was varied from let us say 45 to 75 and at 54 volts at an angle of 50 degrees a very sharp peak was detected. That means, the electron was not behaving like a particle, it was behaving like a wave and then because of the knowledge of the spacing between Bragg planes because of this angle we can calculate what this wavelength is. But first thing is the electron is not behaving like a particle, it is behaving like a wave and we can calculate from the experimental data what the wavelength of the electron is. In order to have wavelength of the size of the spacing between the Bragg planes which is roughly 1 into 10 to the power minus 10 the Bragg planes. So, that the effect of diffraction of electrons from these planes are maximized the potential has to be around 50 volts. So, this is the geometry once again we have the incident beam it gets reflected at an angle of 50 degrees and if we take the angle of incidence equal to angle of reflection then the angle between the normal and the incident beam is 25 degrees and the Bragg planes are normal to this direction they are normal to this direction because this angle is 25 this angle is 25 that means this incident beam is incident at an angle of 65 degrees to the Bragg planes. The spacing of the Bragg planes is d which is roughly 1 into 10 to the power minus 10 meters. So, everything is now there known this angle is known the spacing of Bragg planes is known. So, we can calculate the wavelength of the electron. The exact spacing of the Bragg planes was determined by x-ray diffraction and this was 0.091 nanometers. So, we will have this data and use this to find out the wavelength of the electron and see if the de Broglie hypothesis is correct or not, but these are Bragg planes. So, once again look at the geometry this is the incident beam this is the diffracted beam this angle is 25 degrees this angle is 25 degrees. So, that the total angle is, is 50 degrees and this is the normal to the Bragg planes therefore, we, we can draw the Bragg planes and the angle between the incident beam and the Bragg planes is 65 degrees the spacing between the Bragg planes is known by x-ray diffraction to be equal to 0.091 nanometers. So, we use the Bragg relation 2 d sin theta equal to lambda for n equal to 1 and d being known 0 0.91 10 to the power minus 10 meters theta being known equal to 65 degrees lambda is therefore, 2 into 0 0.91 into 10 to the power minus 10 into 0 0.9063 and if you multiply all this we get 1.65 into 10 to the power minus 10 meters. This figure is sin of 65 degrees we need 2 d sin theta 2 d sin theta and that is equal to lambda if n is equal to 1. So, if we calculate this lambda this turns out to be 1.67 into 10 to the power minus 10 meters. If you recall the calculation that we did earlier for 54 volts we found the we found theoretically the wavelength to be exactly of this size. Thus, Davison and Germer experiment confirmed the dual nature of matter as well as radiation. They showed that matter particles behave like waves and we have already seen that wave waves behave like particles. So, waves behave like particles particles behave like waves. So, this gives us the insight into how matter behaves into its dual nature the wave nature and the particle nature. Davison and G P Thompson who independently confirmed the relationship G P Thompson was working in England and he independently performed this experiment both of them won Nobel prize. To fix the ideas of the dual nature of matter let us take a few examples. We recall that for a non relativistic particle what is a non relativistic particle whose velocity is much smaller than the velocity of light ok that is v is much less than c the de Broglie relation is lambda equal to h by p. So, given p we can find lambda given v 
and m we can find lambda given m and e we can find lambda. So, let us use these relations and consolidate what we have learned about the de Broglie relationship. Find the de Broglie wavelength of an electron with kinetic energy equal to 100 electron volts. So, E is given. So, all that we do is we substitute E here. We know M, we know H, therefore, we can find lambda. And if you do that, you will calculate correctly, you will get lambda equal to 1.2 into 10 to the power minus 10 meters. A particle of mass M is falling under gravity. This is interesting. We have a particle which is falling under gravity. How would the de Broglie wavelength of the particle vary with height h from the ground? You see, if the particle at height h, then it has potential energy mgh. When it hits the ground, this potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy mgh. So, once again, we know E and we know that the wavelength is inversely proportional to the square root of E from this formula. The lambda is inversely proportional to the square root of E. So, therefore, E is now proportional to H. Therefore, the wavelength of this particle would vary as 1 by square root of H, square root of the height from which the particle is falling. Let us take another case. Suppose the particle has charge Q and is moving with velocity u in the x direction, particle is moving in the x direction. It has a charge Q it has a velocity u and then it enters an electric field E directed opposite to the direction of its motion. Electron is like this, charge is like this and the electric field is in the opposite direction. Find the de Broglie wavelength at time t. Now, the magnitude of velocity after time t is, we are assuming that the charge is negative, that is the field is acting in this direction. If charge is positive, then we will take the field in that direction. So, that it has acceleration q e by m. So, if it had acceleration q e by m, then velocity after time t would be u plus a t that is u plus q e by m times t. So, lambda is h by m v. We know v now given by this formula. So, we substitute here, we take u outside and therefore, it becomes h by m u into 1 plus q e by m u times t. At t equal to 0, the wavelength is h by m u, we call that lambda 0. So, lambda 0 is h by m u. Substitute it back in this formula, we get lambda at time t is equal to lambda 0 by 1 plus q e by m u times t. That means, as time increases, lambda decreases. So, with time, lambda is decreasing. Why is it decreasing? Because the particle is increasing the energy of the particle or the momentum of the particle is increasing. If the charged particle were to enter a magnetic field, there would be no change in its wavelength because the magnetic field does not change the magnitude of its momentum. We have done that when we did Lorentz force. Lorentz force is E v cross b and this is perpendicular to both v and b. Therefore, it cannot affect v that means it does not change the momentum of the particle when it enters the magnetic field. If the electric field is at right angle to the particle's initial velocity, particle is going in this x direction and let us say the electric field is in the y direction, then the particle is accelerated in the y direction. So, it acquires a velocity there, it also has a velocity here. Therefore, it is you can compound these two and you can see the velocity would be velocity along the y axis squared plus velocity along the x axis squared and square root of that would be the velocity. So, velocity would be u squared plus q e t by m squared because along the y axis the initial velocity is 0. Therefore, at time t the velocity is simply a t that is q e t by m. So, the velocity would be u squared plus q e t by m square under root and at t equal to 0 at t equal to 0, the velocity is simply u. Therefore, lambda is h by m v, lambda 0 being h by m u. Therefore, at time t, the wavelength is lambda 0 by 1 plus q e t by u m squared. You see, u we have taken out and therefore, u m square is here. 
So, it becomes 1 plus q e t by u m square where lambda 0 is h by m u. So, again as time increases the wavelength decreases from lambda 0. It is lambda 0 at time t equal to 0 and as time advances the wavelength decreases. If the orbit of the particle is elliptic as it is when it is under the influence of a force which is directed towards the origin you see if you have a central force which is always towards the origin then you know the particle undergoes a elliptic orbit Kepler's law that if there is a central force say the force of gravitation between the sun and the planet the planet has elliptic path. So, if the force is central that is it is always directed towards the origin then the orbit of the particle is elliptic and when it is nearest to the origin its velocity is maximum when it is farthest from the origin its velocity is the least. So, therefore, velocity larger therefore, the lambda would be minimum lambda would be minimum at this point here the velocity is least therefore, lambda would be maximum. So, if the particle is in an orbit elliptic orbit around a an origin then at the point where the particle is nearest to the origin it has a higher velocity and smaller wavelength on the other hand when the particle is here it has lower velocity and higher wavelength. Now, let us come back to Bohr model remember when we were discussing Bohr model I told you that there is no justification there was no justification at that time for the fact that electrons move in stationary orbits that was one of the postulates of Bohr that why did he have to do that? Because if if the particle is not in a stationary orbit, it will radiate, it will lose energy and slowly fall back on the nucleus. This was the defect in the Rutherford model, which Bohr sort of rectified by assuming that or by postulating that these orbits are stationary orbits and when the particle moves in these stationary orbits, the particle does not lose energy and does not fall onto the nucleus that was the postulate there was no justification at that time except to prevent the particle from radiating. Now, with de Broglie hypothesis in hand one can now justify the Bohr's postulate how you see in Bohr atom the angular momentum is in quantum orbit n of radius r is given by L equal to m v r which is n times h by 2 pi or n h cross. Since the de Broglie wavelength of the electron is lambda which is h by m v you substitute m v from here then you get this relation 2 pi r equal to n lambda. What does this mean? This means that when the radius of the orbit is r say it is in nth orbit and the radius is r then its circumference 2 pi r that is equal to n times the wavelength the de Broglie wavelength of the electron that is in the first orbit the circumference of the first orbit is equal to just one de Broglie wavelength of electron. When in the second orbit n equal to 2 the circumference is equal to 2 times the wavelength of electron and so on. So, this is what de Broglie hypothesis tells us. Now, let us see how it helps in achieving the aim that this orbit when the electron is in this orbit it will not radiate. The waves along a stationary orbit form stationary waves you can see that these are stationary waves these are also stationary waves this is n equal to 3 you can see there are 3 wavelengths and they join from end to end you know do not know where the beginning is or where the end is. So, there are stationary waves they are all in phase this is also in stationary waves. So, if we accept de Broglie hypothesis which we must because of division germer experiment then these waves corresponding to the orbit n equal to 3 these are stationary waves. And the important thing is this that the electron in this orbit that is in the orbit n equal to 3 behaves like a stationary wave and not as a particle being held by centripetal force you remember in the Bohr model we had electron going like this there was centri the centripetal force needed for 
it to go in this orbit was provided by the electrostatic field between the nucleus and the electron. Now, this is not necessary, we do not need the electric field between the between to provide the centripetal force necessary for the electron to go in this orbit. The electron in this orbit because of these stationary waves, stationary waves these waves are the Broglie waves. So, the electron is in a stationary wave, it cannot move away, it does not need the centripetal force to be supported by the electrostatic field between the nucleus and the electron. And since it is in a stationary orbit does not need any electrostatic force to support it. Therefore, the question of radiating question of this electron radiating does not arise. You see the electron was radiating in the Bohr model because of the fact that it was accelerated and therefore, it, it had to radiate according to the laws of electrodynamics. Here the electron is behaving like a stationary wave therefore, it is not acting like a particle held back held by centripetal force. It does not radiate and does not fall into the nucleus, it does not need to radiate, it does not fall into the nucleus therefore, these are stationary orbits. You see the important distinction is this that in Bohr's model the necessary centripetal force for the electron was provided by the electrostatic field and the electron was accelerated and therefore, it had to radiate by the laws of electrodynamics. Here the particle is just a wave a stationary wave it is not behaving like a charged particle being held by the electrostatic force. So, therefore, it does not need to radiate if it does not need to radiate this becomes the stationary orbit. So, Bohr's postulate that electron can have only certain orbits and these orbits will be stationary so that it does not radiate is now being justified by de Broglie principle. If these waves do not form stationary waves that there is a phase difference between this end and this beginning or this end this beginning at this end if there is a phase difference that means, the wave does not close on itself then this orbit is not a stationary orbit and the this orbit in fact, is a disallowed or prohibited or forbidden orbit. Only those orbits where the waves are in phase and therefore, they form a stationary wave only those orbits are allowed orbits. Let us take a few more examples. What is the de Broglie wavelength of a nitrogen gas molecule at 27 degrees Celsius mass of a molecule of nitrogen gas is given. How do you find that all that we need to find the kinetic energy and we know that the kinetic energy of a molecule at temperature absolute T is 3 by 2 K B T where K B is Boltzmann constant and this capital T in this case is 300 degrees K 27 degrees Celsius is is equal to 300 degrees absolute. So, all that we need to do is to find E 3 by 2 K B T and substitute in the formula H by 2 pi M E square root. So, we can find we know M we know E 3 by 2 K B T. So, we can therefore, lambda is H by 3 M K B T. So, substitute the value of M K B Boltzmann constant and T and you get the wavelength wavelength turns out to be 2.8 into 10 to the power minus 11 meters. Calculation is simple if you understand the principle. What would be the de Broglie wavelength of a particle of rest mass m 0 and velocity c? You know this particle with rest mass m 0 and velocity c is nothing but a photon. So, what would be the de Broglie wavelength of a photon? The momentum of the photon we have already found that is and therefore, we substitute the value of that and we can get the the wavelength of a photon de Broglie wavelength of a photon or formally we can write lambda is h by m v m is m 0 divided by 1 minus v square by c square under root. So, therefore, h by m v becomes h by m 0 c into this thing and at v equal to c this is 0 therefore, lambda is 0. So, the 
at v equal to c that is for a photon the de Broglie wavelength is 0. A photon and an electron have the same energy what would be the relation between their wavelengths. Photon has a wavelength given by its energy you know energy is equal to h nu. So, therefore, if we know energy we can find the wavelength. On the other hand electron would have de Broglie wavelength which is given by h by m v. So, we can find the wavelength of the electron for the photon it is h c by e and for the electron it is h by square root of 2 m e. If the energy is the same in the two cases then lambda p h by lambda e lambda p h by lambda e let us say square it. So, that we remove this problem. So, it becomes 2 m c by h because this e when you square this gets cancelled and therefore, it will give you 2 m c by h. Okay? So, since h is very small therefore, this ratio is very large that is the wavelength of a photon is much much larger than the de Broglie wavelength of a photon of a of an electron of the same energy. So, we have two photons two particles photon and electron photon has wavelength this electron has wavelength this and if the energy is the same then we find that the photon has a much larger wavelength than the de Broglie wavelength of the electron. Which of the following is the electron de Broglie wave associated with the third Bohr orbit? You remember that relation 2 pi r equal to n lambda. So, just count the number of lambdas complete lambdas and you can say that this is stationary. This is the which of the following is the de electron de Broglie waves associated with the third or Bohr orbit. So, where there are th three complete waves here there are more than three here there are less than three. So, the here there are just three electron waves satisfying the relation 2 pi r equal to 3 lambda right. This is the circumference of the orbit. So, therefore, this is the orbit Bohr orbit for which the electron de Broglie wave associated satisfies this condition. Remember that n lambda is 2 pi r n where r n is the radius of the nth orbit. Option b has three wavelengths. So, it satisfies this relation and therefore, this is the right answer. We have already shown that lambda is h by p equal to h by square root of 2 m e and if e is due to the charged particle moving in a certain potential difference v then it is h by 2 m q v. So, lambda is inversely proportional to the square root of v. So, we plot the de Broglie wavelength against the accelerating voltage and we find this relationship that is de Broglie wavelength is inversely proportional to the square root of v. Now, in the next lecture we shall make use of the de Broglie wavelengths of electrons and see whether we can have a microscope in which electron waves are used. That means, we, we have an electron microscope. So, we will discuss the electron microscope and we shall also discuss how electrons can be you see if electrons cannot pass through the, the optical lenses, lenses of let us say glass because the electrons will be absorbed the, the glass is not transparent to the electrons. We will need special lenses these lenses we shall see are due to the magnetic fields these are called electromagnetic lenses. So, we shall discuss the concept of electromagnetic lenses and then we shall also discuss the, the um, resolving power of an elect of a microscope and thereby of an electron microscope and see the advantages of electron microscope over optical microscope.